So, this is going to be interesting. Tuesday, September 21st, a little bit before 3 o'clock, a little bit before the uh, on-air show hits. And all this week, Haunted Hydro tickets on the air. Q105, between 5 and 5.30. Uh, the majority of, today, of today's podcast content is going to be me being on another podcast. Um, my friend from many years ago now, who was one of the first people who invited me to come speak about mental health at the University of Finley, Dr. Andrea Mata, um, who is in their behavioral health department there and beyond, um, she's got a podcast now. So I have our conversation here for you today and you can look her up and, um, we, we did her podcast and then just chatted, chatted and caught up a little bit after the official recording of that ended but a couple of things first please if you get a second and I don't want to keep going over this I mean I want to because I I want things to get better but the answer just seems so goddamn obvious um today was the third in the uh, a trilogy of articles of great uh great journalism by uh Caitlin Durbin who is leaving the blade as much as she likes mushrooms on pizza, I'm okay with that. No, Caitlin is is a great girl, and we're losing yet another great journalist in the area because apparently the Blade doesn't treat their employees all that great. You might have noticed an exodus over the last handful of months. Uh, my friend Jay, who now works over at WTOL. Allison, uh, who covered uh, a lot of crime and court at the Blade. She just left. Um, Ruby's mom, Liz is now she's gone working at the Huffington Post and they're going to leave the area. And now Caitlin. So Caitlin has been working on um, the murders and homicides and crime that we've been dealing with, the pandemic within the pandemic here in Toledo. And it's fairly obvious stuff, but you should read the stories and read the quotes because she talked to people in these communities and maybe there's a way that you can help them. Um, One quote jumped out to me today. Uh, it's from, I think, a it's from a therapist. Um, she was talking about uh, how some of the kids that she encounters, it's too late to help them in many ways. They're 26 years old and they're already caught up in the life of crime and maybe their life expectancy is mostly over because of the lifestyle of, well, let me read this. It's hard because it's like if you were born in a different neighborhood, in a different family, in a different levels of intervention, you would not be sitting here. Mrs. Brewster laments of the youth she treats. You'd be the captain of the football team. You'd be graduated with all honors. It's about the neighborhood. I mean, every one of these stories I come across says where you were born has so much impact on the outcome of your life. Um, There is a maybe a one number zip code difference, a one mile difference between someone winding up in a complete life of crime and being dead or in jail at 26 or someone who is 26 years old and is making $47,000 a year and has taken the first couple of big steps towards where they want to be in life. A mile, a number and a zip code. So let's take all this federal aid here, the $180 million, let's take it all over in, in, in big cities all over. And let's build better neighborhoods so that we don't have to go to shame that kid grew up in that neighborhood or else he wouldn't have turned out or like this or dead like this. Let's build those neighborhoods. There was another story today. I read Vox every day. And um, let's see the title of this article. And this is on on Twitter. Um, I, I, on my Twitter at Eric underscore chase when quitting your job feels like the only option, how a potent mix of frustration and optimism led to the great resignation. And it was all very predictable. And, you know, I've talked about this before, but this is the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm really on. So I'm going to read my tweet. Do not work full time hours without appropriate pay or benefits. You're literally wasting time. 40 miserable hours for $26,000, no health insurance, and it's not your chosen vocation. I'm going to get to Andrea here, so I'll just say this with another exclamation point. If you're making shit money at a place you don't see yourself growing, stop. You can go make shit money while you're progressing in what you want to do with your future. 
Okay. In fact, we talk about that a little bit with Andrea here. She's a good friend. Again, she I can never thank her enough for helping me get started down this path of realizing what I should talk about and who I should talk to. And as always, I'm always happy to help you. Hello, hello. Welcome to this episode of the Bright Spot Podcast. Today, I have my a fellow podcaster, Eric Chase, with me. Um, I first met Eric, uh, man, it's been a while. Um, he used to be the, the a morning show host on the local radio station, um, which I listened to every morning. I was like a, a loyal listener, and I royally enjoyed or thoroughly enjoyed Eric as the host and then it with budget cuts and those kind of things then they decided to cancel that or terminate whatever word you want to use that morning show and then I was super super sad and I remember I emailed Eric and I told him that the the bigger media station was were idiots in my professional opinion <laughs> um, for for canceling that morning show and then Eric and I just kind of became friends after that so Eric welcome to the bright spot podcast thank you if if we want to get technical and specific, I think before it was popular to say this, you slid into my Twitter DMs. I did because it's been a, like a years. Uh, How many years four, have we kind of been friends? Four, four, four years, four years. Uh, Cause I, my, my job was taken from me on like June 6th or 7th of 2017. You're not still bitter or anything about that. No, 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 no. I'm more bitter at the overall landscape of of what and who is left with in my industry and yeah, not locally speaking. Um it's it's more on the large scale. Um but we can talk about that another time if you want. Absolutely. Okay. So, Eric, why don't you tell my listeners a little bit about who you are and what your story is? Um, well, I'm 42 years old. I'm originally from Philadelphia and, um, most of my adult life has been spent in the Midwest in, uh, the Detroit area. And now the last, got almost nine years now, um, in Toledo and Toledo has become my home because when my job vanished, um, I was really unwilling to go, to another market and restart all over again only for another job to go away. And a lot of people like yourself had reached out to me and thanked me um, when the show went away for talking about all the, the mental health challenges and struggles that I had. And that was kind of a um, a big flag in my face that my work here in Toledo was, was not done, even if that meant that um, there'd be no more radio and media or whatever it might be. Um, I I was a, a beacon for people or I wanted to be a voice for people who had a hard time discussing their own mental health issues. And that was four years ago. And I guess with the way life is, at least over the last 18 months, time has played tricks with us. But mm-hmm. that, that four years since I've really ramped up all this mental health advocacy, um, it, it feels like a lot longer than that. And I keep telling people there are some silver linings of the pandemic. And one of them is that more and more people are no longer ignoring their mental health issues, no matter what kind of relationship um, adversarial or not they had towards their own mental health or that of others. Um, you were no, lang- no longer able to ignore that because everyone, like literally, except for those people who live on that that island in the middle of the Indian Ocean and kill people that visit it, everybody on the planet has been affected by um, the pandemic. Many, obviously, mm-hmm. lives lost um, and people have gotten very sick. Um, but more so, everyone's mental health has been affected, whether it was just a small degree or an avalanche of mental health struggles, it's it's now at the forefront, and many people now treat it as they would, as we've always talked about. Um, you know, you got to treat your mental health like you would treat a broken leg, because it's equally as important. And a lot of people have come to realize that over the last eighteen months. Absolutely, and it's funny. I'll say I'll come back to the mental health piece, but you are currently the second person on my podcast, and I've only recorded a few of these episodes so far, who is originally from Philly. So, but I did not ask my previous um, guest, "What's the best Philly cheesesteak place?" Um, 
Pats, where someone just got murdered at a couple of nights ago. There's Pats and Genos. Those are the tourist traps in South Philly near the stadiums. Um, Gyms, which is around different parts of the city, is very good. There's one on South Street. Um, My preference, I forget what part of town it's in, um, but it's called Delisandro's. And it's off the beaten path. It's kind of in a neighborhood. It's not a tourist trap. But Delisandro's is a really good cheesesteak. I know I think I have had Pats and Gino or G, Gino's, yeah, when I was there um, a few years ago with my grad school best friend. Um, but then we've always talked about like Mr. Spots here in Bowling Green is a very, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a close kind of cheesesteak, right? Yeah, I haven't had it for a couple of years. Um, and the first time I visited that place, they had lots of Philly sports paraphernalia and they actually have sandwiches named after the exact neighborhoods where where I grew up in. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, like in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Northeast Philadelphia is the part of the city that I grew up in. And all those sandwiches, like I I forget them now, Um, but they're they're neighborhoods that I grew up in and played sports in when I was a kid. And it's it's good food. They, uh, I believe they have Amoroso Rolls flown in from the east coast and there's something about the the way the water is made with the bread there it just tastes different so the water um and the nitrates or whatever is in there makes the bread taste different and that's why it's really hard to replicate um a philly cheesesteak anywhere outside of the east coast okay then i mean it's it's delicious i i'm a big fan of mr spots so let's go back to that mental health piece yeah absolutely i think because if you try to, as of right now, being in that space, um, if you try to get in with any therapist, chances are you're going to have a wait list. Um, I think my practice right now, for the majority of the the psychologists who have been there, you know, longer than I have, they're all on like four to six month wait lists. Um, I think I'm on like a two month wait list right now, just because I just started there in June. Um, but I mean, I know like there's a center up in Ann Arbor that they are on like a one year wait list. Yeah, I can concur with all the things that I've heard because people started to reach out to me in the summertime and they're like, hey, I know you do this. Can you connect me with someone? And the people that I reached out to, they were like, I, I, I'm just not taking any more patients at this time. Um, I've actually been looking for a new uh, a new therapist lately. And I have a, I had a a friend make a personal connection and whether they're just a little slow on their end or they're truly backed up or whatever it is, I'm having a hard time getting in to find somebody. So again, it's, it's that silver line. I mean, it, it, the silver lining doesn't come without its sharp spikes. People are exploring working on their mental health. It's just going to take time and hopefully it's not too late for people to get into the right places. Like I, you know, I I've sent people to my doctor before because my PCP, because he, uh, he writes up my scripts for medication. He just helped me make an adjustment not long ago, which has been another life saving change. Um, Mm -hmm. if, if anybody trusts any kind of medical professional, like I trust my PCP and you can't get somewhere else, go to that person. Absolutely. Okay. So what do you, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Like your story? Cause you have an entertaining story of like your, your, I remember I always kind of tell students and clients about like the, the day that you found out what your diagnosis was and your response to that. Um, it was like 2005 and I just like, my life was good. Um, I had a good job maybe the best social circle of friends I've had in a while. And I was living in Saginaw, which I hated. So that goes to show you, I hated living where I was, but I liked the ecosystem and the orbit that I lived in at the time. My money was good. I had a dog, like everything was, I was in my mid twenties, like everything was good. And there'd be mornings I'd wake up and I'd be like, well, this sucks. There was just this heaviness, um, which I began to call a funk that loomed over, over me. And because I'm always so curious and inquisitive and I'm, I'm an infivore. Um, I wanted to know why I was feeling like that when everything in my life was good. So I didn't hesitate and I sought out a counselor, a therapist. I don't know who the hell or what she was at the time, but I explained all this to her and some of these bouts of energy um, that I would have, and they'd be very productive. They would not be reckless or dangerous. And, and maybe if I look back in some ways, there were some dangerous or questionable things, but nothing, no more so than your typical mid-20-something-year-old person. 
And uh, she's like, well, I, this sounds like bipolar two, which is a lesser form of the disorder. And I'm more willing to throw away labels and things than, than ever before in my life if it means that someone will get help for their symptoms. And um, she gave me that. And I literally jumped out of the chair. And I, I think I kind of high-fived her or hugged her because I now knew who the villain was for the longest mm-hmm. time when I was feeling like junk. I didn't know how to combat it. Um, but now I knew that there was something going on. There was a label and a title on it. There was a face of this foe, and I started buying. I, I think I can. I know I continued with counseling, and um, I started getting a lot of books um, to read up on this, to learn some minuscule coping techniques to get through it. But just knowing what it was, just like anybody with a physical diagnosis, when you go from doctor to doctor and nobody can tell you what's going on, just knowing what it was was such a relief. Absolutely. Yeah. And I always I I always say that there's like in my experience and my opinion, there's like two types of people. There's people that when you give them that diagnosis, they have a similar experience to you where they're like, yes, we now know who to fight. It's not me. It's this this other thing with like eating disorders. We call it like Ed with like OCD. We call it like your OCD or you can name it and those kind of things. But then there's this other group of individuals um, that when you give them that diagnosis, it's almost like you've you've given them a death sentence that it they they fall into like labeling theory and it's like okay that def- now defines who they are and i remember when i was at boys town on internship i had a, a young client so a young 14 year old female client and she was originally from the South. So she's up in, you know, Omaha, Nebraska for treat specifically for treatment. And I remember she walks in and she looks at me and she tells me what her name is. And she goes, and I have bipolar disorder. And I was like, what? Like you, she said, literally said her name and then, and I have bipolar disorder. And it was just a part of her identity because she had been diagnosed with it when she was four years old. So like 10 years prior, she had been diagnosed with it. And I remember she did the same thing as my supervisor walked in because my supervisor had to meet all of my clients because I was still an intern. Um, and she walks in and she did the same thing to my my supervisor. And then after I finished up the initial evaluation with this 14 year old, I go to meet with my supervisor. And she, the first thing she looks at me and she goes, do you think she has bipolar disorder? And I was like, no, she's like, I don't think she has bipolar disorder either. And we're going to have to like tease that apart. So it took me quite a few months with that client and her her family because her family would fly up for sessions occasionally, not all like not weekly, but occasionally. And it took us a while to kind of tease apart like the the client's identity from from like the disorder, if that makes sense. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, I do. When and and I see this a lot now. I've I, I have some friends in the the disability community. Um, I'm close. I have some really good friends who work at the Ability Center here in Toledo, which is an incredible place. And I obviously don't want to offend anybody. And then that's why um, I always encourage people to look for in, intent behind someone's words or actions. That that speaks more than anything else. I obviously like if you don't want to be called handicapped or disabled, I don't want to call you that. But if it's the first time I'm putting a label on something, I obviously don't mean any offense. And To be quite honest, I think in some ways we're getting buried in semantics. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and I'm sure you can appreciate that. So, I try to dance around it like one thing I dance around these days more commonly in where my play box is, my sandbox is, is I know people don't like saying, uh, don't like hearing committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, they committed murder, committed suicide. Like, I see how they're trying, how the gray area comes in, but you didn't. You didn't commit cancer. You didn't commit pneumonia. So I like to split the baby. And instead of saying committed suicide, I say killed themselves. <laughs> um, oh uh, again, it, it's all just semantics and, and, mm-hmm. and intent is important. But I get your point of why some people feel broken and dead when they get a, a, diagno- a mental health diagnosis. Because the unfortunate part is um, in many ways – Opposite of cancer, we can cure a lot of cancers these days, especially the farther out from it you go. You're not curing this. You're, you're, you're always going to have the depression and the anxiety and, and whatever other mental health challenge afflict you. And 
as you grow, it will grow, and it's it's often a moving target. And that's why, like, for three years, four years, I just dealt with being really lethargic and wanting to nap all day. Um, not, I just figured, oh, I'm getting older. That's what it is. Never for once did I guess that it was because it was a side effect of my Cymbalta, something that I absolutely will never not be able to take or something similar to it to keep the anxiety that wanted me to jump, wanted me to jump in front of a train, um, to kill myself because I just wanted to get away from it so bad. So I can understand why some people get very upset when they get a diagnosis like that. But that's where they we've got to spin it like, okay, it's not curable, but it's completely treatable. Like you have not like lost a leg or a limb or been lobotomized or your nose didn't fall off. Like this is totally manageable. Right. And I think that's something that you and I are friends, but that's one thing that you and I probably disagree on is that like, it, you know, you're going to, you're going to be on this forever. You're going to have this forever. It's not curable. Whereas like, I, I, I believe that there's a lot of mental illnesses that are in fact curable. Um, as long as you get those right skills, but that's for a different podcast and a different discussion. Well, and again, All right, let's, hold on, wait, just real fast. Semantics. You haven't cured absolutely. it. Absolutely. You haven't cured it. You have just kept it at bay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to this other piece. So what do you think families are struggling with today? What are they facing? Issues, struggles? Um, The first thing that jumps to mind is back to pandemic stuff where in the past, parents, adults, because your mind is more formed at that point, um, have been able to help kids and adolescents through challenging times whether they were doing it correctly or not I, you know, I I don't know I would I would say that many have not done it real well um, um, and some of that shows but that's part of the larger family structure discussion that's evolved over the last 30 years but now I think those parents who did their best with what I was just talking about are now are now struggling an equal amount of as their kids are. So it's just all kinds of mental chaos in people's households because the parents are having a hard time keeping it together with all the additional responsibilities and burdens that have been placed on them over the last 18 months. So everybody's just, you know, running around like a chicken with the head cut off. And as you said, nobody can get in to see anybody to get any kind of help. That's why, you know, I'm always pushing the free text lines for resources and e- as bad as the internet can be, it can be equally as helpful to access places and just online groups and virtual things to, to get some help. But just the utter chaos that the normal family unit is in right now. So just the chaos. So what are some practical tips, tools, and tricks that you would recommend for families to kind of address that the chaoticness that families are currently facing? The one that popped into my head last week or two weeks ago, and I don't know why, it's one of the ones that I learned from my my David Brooks book, which is probably four decades old now, and I, I think he's updated it, though the original is still the, the go-to. Talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself. Um, and the extension of that with the David Brooks CBT philosophy is talk to yourself as you would talk to a friend. Um, if I told you that, hey, guess what? Just lost my job again. Um, I'd probably be beating myself up and thinking, oh, you know, I'm never going to work again. I'm going to have to leave the industry. You're not going to go to console me. You're right. Your show sucked and you're probably never going to work again like my own head is going to me. You're going to say, Eric, you have worked your ass off for four years in mental health advocacy and you know everybody in Toledo. You, someone is going to hire you and you're going to enjoy working for that person. This is just the next challenge or the next phase of your life that you can be successful in as you have been in all other walks of life. So... Talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself and talk to yourself as you would talk to someone you care about. Those are those are great tips. And yeah, so he updated it to it's now I'm looking at it right now. It's called feeling great <laughs> um, is his new updated version yeah. of the, the book you were talking about. 
Yeah, it. I have the updated edition, and I just keep going back to the old, the old book that I have. I, I didn't get a whole heck of a lot out of it, but you know, look, times have changed. Time, like, like we just went back and forth about curable, not curable. Things are going to uh-huh. change. Um, we're going to be able to image these things very easily in doctor's offices rather than giant MRI machines long before you and I are both dead. So this stuff will be more treatable. Mm -hmm. And so I know like another thing that you kind of talk about that you advocate for is finding the right therapist. Can you talk a little bit about your, your belief in that? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like dating, as long as you don't have some arranged marriage, which is probably not going to be all that healthy, uh, healthy anyway. Um, it's totally fine to not jive with any kind of um, medical professional in in the same way that there are bad radio hosts on the spectrum of good and bad. I mean, there's bad at every profession, and you just hope that that profession is not airline pilot or your doctor, but the reality is there's a spectrum of good and bad. And if you're not jiving with somebody, whether it's a psychiatrist who you don't think is listening to you and you just think that they're envisioning who you are, they hear a couple of buzzwords and they're writing the script, or it's counselor who you don't think is hearing with you and... Like when you're dating somebody, some red flags go up. Those same same red flags can happen with a counselor or a therapist or a psychologist, wherever that might be. And if those red flags go up and and you, you take a second, you take a breath and you have perspective outside of that session and go, I don't think this person's right for me. In the same way that you would break up with somebody you're dating, it's totally fine to break up with a counselor. And any counselor or therapist worth who they are would appreciate you recognizing that you're you're not a good match, so this would you can move on. This allows them to try to help somebody else, and you can find the person that's right for you. It's the same thing we do with dating. We date through a bunch of people until we find the person that we that can finish our sentences and that we don't want to uh, um, Netflix and chill with. We actually want to watch the entire movie with. Absolutely, and I think that's probably like the frustrating thing, especially with how long wait lists are right now, is that, you know, okay, you think that you, you know, you read their bio on Psychology Today, or you found their, you know, website, and you read their bio, and you're like, oh, I think this person's going to be a really good fit, and then, or, you know, they're they're on your insurance plan, so you're like, oh, let me give this person a try, and then, like, you go in, and you sit down with them. If you're not vibing, I would say, with that person person in the first session maybe two sessions like if you don't feel completely like com- not completely comfortable but like if you don't feel a connection with that therapist i would mental health provider or whatever word you want to term whatever you want to use i would say like find a different one and i know it's frustrating because you probably just did you know a long wait list but that's why i would say like cast a wide net get on a few different therapists um, wait lists and so that you can kind of you can interview them and that is completely okay I always say that like my superpower is building relationships with people extreme or rapport extremely quickly but like I'm not so egotistical that I think that like I am everyone's therapist um, because I'm not everyone's cup of tea Um, there's going to be people that I don't you know gel with or vibe with and there's going to be people that I'm too sarcastic or too direct or those kind of things and those I would much rather that person be like uh oh, we're not really we're not really you know I'm, like I'm not I'm not really connecting with you like I'm going to go find a different therapist and I will be the first person to help you try to find a different therapist um so that 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 person that can vibe with because and the reason why I have this belief is that one of the number one predictor of whether or not someone will experience change through therapy is whether or not the client's engaged. And if the client's not engaged and they're not willing to change, well, then there's nothing that's going to be done. Uh, another significant predictor is whether or not the the relationship between the therapist and the client is a strong one. If there's if that relationship's not there, then the person again is probably not changing. Chemistry is often overlooked in life in every aspect of our lives, whether it's personal or professional. Um, if you take up 
a team, whether it's on the field or in a, in a workplace, and there's all the talent in the world, but they don't work well together. You give me people who are of lesser talent but have chemistry, we're going to win because chemistry can really make up for a lot of blind spots. And again, that's applicable to everything. And if if someone is listening to this and they're like, chemistry describes why I get along with my husband or my boyfriend. Like, you're absolutely right. What you're talking about, like how you fight, how you communicate, how you don't communicate. That's all chemistry and it's vitally important in any interpersonal relationship. Yeah, because I mean, I've had... So like my therapeutic style is completely different compared to others. And there's there's clients that I definitely gel, have a chemistry with. um, And there's others that I don't have a chemistry with. And I'll I'll be the first one to tell them, like, "Mm, I don't think this is necessarily working out um, for one reason or another. And obviously me as the psychologist has to approach that in a very different way than the client would need to. So the client doesn't feel like I'm abandoning them or that they're, you know, they're not good enough or whatnot for me to kind of keep them as my caseload. Would you uh, would you work with a diehard Michigan fan? Yeah, because I mean, yes, I'm an Ohio State fan <laughs> because I married a third generation like Ohio State guy. But like, that's not like on my, you know, intake, like, hey, are you an Ohio State or Michigan fan? Like, if, if you have issues, and you think that I will be a good fit for you, come on by. And we'll give it a try. You could work with that person and let them know that Michigan is not the program that Ohio State is anymore. And you'll te- you'll check two boxes. You'll get them thinking reasonably, and you'll sway in a sway against another Michigan fan. Absolutely. I mean, there's I have plenty of clients who I don't agree with, you know, on a variety of things. But that doesn't mean that I can't be an effective an effective therapist. Yeah. For that person. And. And what the the client patient has to remember is like you are working for them. Like they, Mm -hmm. we, I, we're writing the checks, paying the debit card, whatever. Like you work for us. So, and if it's not working, walk away. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and you might have, you know, spent the money on the initial evaluation or whatnot, but at least then you can hopefully find someone who is effective for you. Sometimes finding out the wrong answers are just as helpful as finding out the right ones. Absolutely. So, Eric, what are some ways that you have kind of used to find, you know, because you've gone through it. I mean, and this sounds terrible, but like, again, like I think it points to the message of like you need to keep shopping. You need to keep looking for the right fit. What are some methods that you have used to find a good or find the different therapist who you've interviewed? I've only had one since I've lived here in Toledo, so I'm not a good, uh, I'm not a good help here. Other than just saying, tap into who you already know. Um, like I said, I use my my doctor, who I trust implicitly, who is the most my PCP, who is the most incisive doctor I've I've ever had, and just watching his galaxy brain work when I've gone to him with issues and. Um, seeing his eyes like roll in the back of his head and he's having like a, this this overwhelming moment trying to figure out and dissect information. If I need an eye doctor, I ask him. If I need such and such, I ask him. So tap into who you already trust in your life. Other than that, like the thing you mentioned, psychology today and just looking things up on the internet and other uh, mental health sites, that's the best way I do feel for people who are looking for help currently at this time though maybe another silver lining of this um i know a lot of people want to leave like er's right now because they're tired of dealing with a certain kind of patient but maybe people will switch from wanting to work into a hospital to wanting to work with mental health and in five or ten years we'll have an overwhelming amount of mental health professionals because obviously it's equally as important as physical health Absolutely. And I think so just to, for people looking, psychologytoday.com. So P-S-Y-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y and then today T-O-D-A-Y.com. It's a, you can search 
for therapists that way, or I think even psychiatrists as well. Um, it's like a, you can specify a variety of characteristics and then they you can even specify like your insurance and such like that. And they will give you a list of mental health providers within a certain area that you have specified um, that you can try. And so that's, that's probably the easiest way um, that I've seen people do it. And then you can always, you know, Google or, you know, Microsoft Edge, whatever search engine you use to find a local therapist or yeah, yeah, definitely like ask people that you already trust. The other thing I should have thrown out, and I, 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 this was like in the infancy of my, my advocacy because I was able to use it, but now not so much. I forget about it, but there are people who don't know about it. If you're fortunate enough to have a pretty decent employer with a good health plan, um, EAP, Employee Assistance Program, these things are more pervasive and widespread now. And they can help you in a lot of avenues of life. And if you're just looking for a psychologist, they often, with these, offer free visits. So you can go on a little date with these people. So tap into your insurance. I know sometimes it can be inscrutable and hard to communicate with these people and understand benefits. And this is not a bill and all that stuff. But but make that call or hop on that website. Absolutely. And Eric, how can my audience uh, connect with you? Um, they can just search Eric Chase on any podcast platform. It's mostly Toledo stuff, though. And um, I work on Q105 in Toledo, which can be found on um, a variety of radio apps. And uh, I, you can find me if you search social stuff as well. Uh, there will be a lot of dog pictures and a lot of superhero stuff. And Transformers. And trans- I mean, that kind of falls under, yeah, I mean, it depends. Again, semantics. Some people might say Transformers <laughs> are superheroes. Some people might say they're completely independent. All right, Eric. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Right Spot episode. Okay. The right Spot podcast. Anytime. All right. I just stopped mine, but if you want to con- if you want to continue chatting for yours, we can. What else do you want to talk about? What have you been up to? Um, let's see. I have, I'm, well, I'm opening my, this business piece that's kind of occupying a lot of my time. Um, just living with my family. So those are, those are all kind of things that I'm working on trying to get back into physical, focusing in on my physical health, which has been a struggle over the last, I'd say probably year and a half post COVID. Um, but yeah, so those are the things. And then just adapting to life, not in academia. Uh, did you guys have a busy summer? Did you go out on the water or anything? I know the kids love it. Uh, yeah, so we went, we have a place on Indian Lake. Um, so we would go there pretty regularly. Um, and then we vacationed it as a family with my husband's parents and sister up in a place on um, in Michigan for five days, I think. So as, as often as we can get to the lake, we are or some body of water we are trying to get to. Good. We unfortunately didn't get to um, our favorite lake, which is Lake Santilla down in North Carolina this year, just because of. Um, me resigning from the university and then starting up at the Anxiety Treatment Center of Greater Toledo. And then my husband, actually, in the same month that I resigned and started a new job, he actually resigned from his position and started a new job. What's uh, what's he doing? So he moved to a different company um, and he's got a longer commute, but he is now no longer a superintendent at a plant, but he is now a project or yeah, project management engineer. Is he is he happy? He is much happier Good. now than he was previously. Yes. What was uh what was your darkest day during the pandemic? The darkest day during the pandemic. Um that's hard to answer because like I was fortunate enough that like given Jim and I's jobs, like we didn't experience the financial um, strain that a lot of other families did because both of our jobs, we were, well, Jim had to go into the plant every single day of, of the, I, I guess I can kind of, when I think about it there, like I remember there was, and this was like the tipping point was uh, in summer of 2020, Jim and I had scheduled a, uh, a date afternoon so we had you know scheduled for the the kids all to go over to my parents house and we were outside playing with the kids and the play with our play set 
And about an hour before Jim and I were about to drop the kids off at my parents' house, he got a call from work and people do, uh, there wasn't enough employees for that shift um, just because of COVID and it was a beautiful day outside. So, um, so the, he didn't have enough employees. So Jim actually had to go in and work that shift. And that was definitely the tipping point, um, that kind of led to a bunch of other things happening throughout 2020 for, I mean, mostly for the better. I think it made us realize that he was significantly unhappy, um, in his, his position just because of the life work balance that wasn't there, um, which then kind of led us down this path um, to us both getting different jobs. Yeah, uh, far be it from me, of all people, to be the, the optimist. But I mean, there have been positives with all of this nonsense, including just that, whether it's Jim and his three quarters of a million dollar a year job with all his Ohio state paraphernalia or he uh, does not make three quarters <laughs> of a million dollars a year or, or somebody making like $11 an hour. Like everybody had some realizations and one of them was like, this job is not worth it. And I, mm -hmm. I appreciate like I was very fortunate. It didn't really affect me a whole hell of a lot because I'm insular by nature. And you know, I, I just, I'm like a, damn cockroach but to watch everybody else just suffer and have to undergo some of these really hard decisions that they're doing and i know you see it like i do it i do like where we're going places and there's not enough employees and blah 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 i mean it has been a reckoning in a lot of ways and i have been able to kind of stand on the sidewalk and walk and watch a lot of it happen and, and a lot of it needed to happen like with the the 15 an hour stuff like it, this was like the largest, largest disorganized union movement in a hundred years, but it it kind of needed to happen because you know some people were were in crappy jobs, getting paid crappy money, and maybe this will be one of the positive changes moving forward that employers of all kinds will be more respectful and thoughtful towards their employees. And I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. And I think the one thing, because like now that I own a small business, it's like there's no way that I would be able to afford to pay someone, um, you know, the I think someone when my, my hairstylist told me that in in Napoleon at the Wendy's, like they were starting off at $18 an hour. And I was like, there's no way that I, as a small business owner, I would be able to pay someone $18 an hour. But at the same time, I would also not treat my employees like crap. Well, it's different though. They can do that because that's Wendy's, you're Andrea's. And like I, I keep harping on, first of all, I have gone very Andrea Mata on uh, the people with their livable wage thing. I know like, you know, it too, we've had a lot of phrases over the last year that are not entirely accurate and mm -hmm. they inflame things on both sides. Like you should not be working. You should not be working for a livable wage at Wendy's. Like you should not aspire to work at Wendy's for your life. But if, right. you, if you offer somebody 12 bucks an hour, there's a place that they like 12 bucks an hour for 20 hours a week. Like, and this is clearly something they want to pursue. It's more meaningful to them. So yeah, Wendy's has to do that stuff and it's, and it's supply and demand, but you're totally different. Like, you no, know you can't pay that, but you can provide so much more to that person and the long run of their life. Like this is far more complex than, than, than money and like, look at our, as you know, with what you might have to deal with. If, are you just doing a uh, private pay, no insurance? Um, so I was when I had my own practice, but now that I'm at the anxiety treatment center of greater Toledo, we do accept multiple insurances. So I'm on three panels right now. So I'm on medical mutual paramount and front path. Like I've thought this for a long time because when my ang you know, this when my anxiety was running me from doctor appointment to doctor appointment. I learned too early in my life, like about copays and premiums, and I learned too much about my health insurance longer than I or way sooner than I needed to. But if it's the difference in like ten thousand dollars in your pocket or no copays and very low premiums, I mean, it's mm -hmm. a different answer for everybody. But like that's income, and that's really important these days. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I think we we just decided as a practice to there's another insurance that we all are or not all of us, but a, a lot of us are going to try to get on the panel just so that we can continue to help as many people in the greater Toledo area as we can. And um, sadly, I mean, we're not going to save everybody. And, th- you know, nope. I, I always uh, I throw out. um what you said a couple of years ago, and I ran it by you. I was like, "What do we say to the, you know these classrooms or whatever, or the the ranty parents who are like, you can't talk about this? That means they're that's that makes them more likely to do it." And I think what you said, and I've paraphrased now, is if we talk about this and one kid kills themselves, there might be five or seven other kids who would have also considered it and made it to that. But we came and talked to your class, and now they've decided to seek out help. Hmm. Absolutely. And I, I mean, that's that's huge, because like if you think like I think the most recent like CDC statistics, which is from 2019, was like, what, 47,000 people like killed themselves. I tried to stay away from that word, that term that you all don't like to use, um, killed themselves in 2019 alone. And then I believe it was like one point two million people in 2019 in the United States attempted to kill themselves. Um, But for lack of a better word, they were unsuccessful. So yeah, like people have this fear that if we, if we talk about it, if we ask the questions that that's going to put ideas in their head, but no, like it doesn't like I was, I was on a, in a workshop with Kevin Hines last week and he was like, no, like you need to be direct and you need to be asking like people that you may have some belief that they might be suicidal you need to ask them three questions you need to ask them like are you thinking about killing yourself do you have a plan for killing yourself and then do you have the methods to carry out that plan and to kind of like for me to try to help people remember what those three questions are i always think like intent so i plan p and then m for methods so like all you have to do is remember like ipm like intent plan and methods to kind of and ask the person be direct and ask them like those three questions because you may not want to hear what they have to say but you could also save their life yeah yeah kevin's got a a really great story it was great to have him a, a couple of times and and speak um it is interesting, though, that um, the toothpaste is out of the tube when we were kids. Like, we didn't think about that. We just dealt with getting bullied and bad days. We didn't mm-hmm. really know that suicide was available to us, thankfully. And But now that, that toothpaste is out. But again, there's there's always things that we can, you know, text 741741. Somebody will get you on the other end and, and help you out. So as many, as much as there are so many ways out there, we're kids can or adults can find a reason to take their own life there are equally amount amounts of ways to to access help there was a i don't know if you 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 probably didn't hear it a kid in sylvania last week i think southview 14 years old hung himself and um i hope at some point when they're ready that the family talks about it because if this is going to be another sylvania or affluent white area sweeping a suicide under the rug you're just planting the seeds for the next one yeah, like I think maybe that had something to do with I had so our our well someone that we both know Bill Barry, um, he reached out to me maybe two three weeks ago and asked me if I would be willing to come to the high school where he works and talk with the students about um, self care. And so I think I'm I'm on the the schedule to go out. I think at the end of October to talk with um, a group of their students about te- kind of taking care of themselves. They're good kids over there. When Jen and I go, they listen and pay attention. Well, that's good to know because last year when I did the I did a self care for their faculty and staff. I mean, it's not like they didn't take they paid didn't pay attention, but you never know what you're going to get when you kind of go into like a middle school environment. I always joke and say that like middle schoolers, like sixth through eighth graders, like I if I was ever a teacher, I mean, I, w- I guess I was a professor, but if I was ever a teacher, I would n- you could not pay me enough money to teach sixth through eighth graders they're just so mean and nasty to each other 
We, uh, I always, we've had to update some of our things. When we would see those kids, we'd always, years ago, we'd ask about Fortnite and then get, get mm-hmm. them interested. But now we moved over to like Among Us and some other things so we can get those kids engaged. Although, Jen, I, I have to tell Jen to stop saying, to introducing me as from the radio to 12 year olds or 13 year olds. I'm like, Jen, <laughs> they don't know what the radio is. Yeah, that's right. They probably do not know what the radio is. All right, I gotta get ready for my show. It was good to catch up. Um, good catching up. Enjoy, uh, enjoy going, getting your uh, your Scottish accent brushed up with Mister Barry. Yes, absolutely. All right, talk to you later. All right, bye, bye.